It's great to be here. And uh, uh, you guys have a, a really beautiful building. <laughs> it's very, very lucky. Um, so aeronautics have been a passion of mine for, for life. And uh, one of my five kids is here. And hopefully she will pick up the baton. We'll see. My 12-year-old my is taking her flight lessons. She's got about 40 hours. Um, so we're kind of an aeronautical family. I'm just, because we're here, I'm, uh, I'm also a pilot, uh, fixed wing, uh, multi IFR and rotary. So I, I enjoy everything about flying that everyone in this room and, and many of your peers do. Um, so uh, tell, tell you about another passion of mine and um, something which is really, over the past 10 years, has come to become a um, more than a passion, but a, a major um, calling. Uh, I was talking to someone, we were talking about work and jobs and things like that, and, and, and he gave me some great advice and thought processes on this. You can have a job, which you go to and you leave, and then usually go somewhere else afterwards and try to have fun, and it's where you see all the things about, you know, Friday is a great day, or the weekends are, are you know, people work for the weekends, that's a job. You can have a career, which is much better, where you actually get to use your intellect, your mind, and your passion to accomplish, accomplish meaningful things. And then you can have a calling. And a calling is something that when you're 80, you can look back and be so excited and proud of that you accomplished it. And for the people in OneWeb, which is a, a very fast-growing team, we're all on a mission with a calling. And, and, and this enabling affordable access for everyone has become a cornerstone for the entire company, for everybody in there to think about. When we're making decisions, we're designing satellites, when we're designing terminals, when we're thinking about how people will use them and how it will affect their lives, enabling affordable access is something which is, it's not a job and it's not even really a career for everybody. It's, we're going to do it. And we get a lot of stuff thrown at us, a lot of problems that we overcome. But it, it, because it's a mission and not a job, it's something which we just keep on persevering. And if you look at history, um, we've all known that for a long time in the 2000s, early, late 1990s, early 2000s, that the ability to get access from space could solve things for rural populations, for remote areas, and for low population densities that all the current technologies just couldn't come close to. Right? Uh, and, and I know a lot about running current technologies, and I'll give you a little example of that. So it's been hard to get to this point where we can build a system that will accomplish those goals. The ITU, and, and many of you in this room probably, were involved in creating a spectrum, uh, a section of spectrum set aside to bridge the digital divide. And that was done in the 90s. Well, technology, we believe, has finally caught up with what all of you and, and many others had thought was possible. And we believe we're, we're really close to, um, to solving this problem. With our recent funding, uh, Masia Shison and SoftBank, who also owns Arm Holdings, they bought this summer, in, uh, and many of you know of here in the UK. Um, and they have a new fund, a $100 billion fund that they're, they're having right here in London. It's based here. Um, but together, they took uh, Masa and, and, and others uh, really grabbed on to this mission because it's so important. How do we bridge the digital divide? How do we ensure everybody in the world has access to high quality internet at a GDP adjusted rate? How can they have a small self-installed terminal that will be affordable to communities, affordable to individuals from all walks of life, and provide their children with as much opportunity as, as you have and your children have living here in the city? And so we're very fortunate, and he invested a billion dollars. We raised 1.2 billion on our, in, in December, we announced that, um, which really gave us another shot in the arm after our 500 million, another real just boost um, to be fully funded to accomplish this mission. So a little bit of the background of sort of how we got there and why it's such a passion. Um, after I sold my first company in my 20s, I went to Africa, not knowing much about what to expect, and just started connecting schools. So I literally like ordered fiber and just asked the government if I could start running it. There wasn't any around. It was Rwanda. It was the, you know, 
it had a pretty bad scenario happen in not too, not too, much, not too many years previous. So they're like, fine, come do it. We'd love to have you. So I just started running fiber and uh, connected about 200 schools and ran fiber in some very, very difficult places. And I uh, had like, at times, 3,200 people trenching, right? And you realize, because I ran fiber too, and I know how to use an OTDR, is sitting in the mud with the minister looking at me while the rain's coming down, trying to figure out why there was a, uh, a backhoe fade, you know, and someone ripped apart the fiber, and I got to put it back together to get the ministry back online. Um, uh, you realize that fiber is wonderful. As long as all the houses are nicely tightly packed together and you have every, all the roads nicely laid out and everything's just perfect and, and mapped. Um, but once the population density gets further apart, these technologies which are designed for high GDP, high population densities, don't really work in low GDP, low population densities. So we needed something else. And even though I had run this fiber, I really looked at, okay, what about 3G? Because this is back years ago, and built the first fiber to the home network in Africa, and also built the first 3G network in Africa. And uh, had a lot of, uh, of, of generators running on towers. Um, and that went, went, went quite well, but the generators was, were hard because you have to have fuel in trucks, and people have to drive that fuel, not to their friend's house, not to somewhere else, they have to drive it to the tower and fill it up. So then you need people to watch them and help guide them so they make it to the tower. And the fuel gets into the tank. And you know, it's a lot of, a lot of challenges. Um, you know, and you're running fiber across, across the, the under, underground and then across bridges. You can't go underground, so you're running across bridges. And, and when you're running across bridges or anywhere it's exposed, the fiber's really easy to tug on and take, so you put it in pipes. Well, it turns out that pipes are also good for other things like running water. I don't blame anybody, but they want to run water. So they want to collect it like into a cistern and things. So there was a pipe sitting in the ground, so why not use it? Uh, so this became a problem. So then we started drilling holes in all the pipes. So before we laid them, you and uh, we bought every pipe that was around in every drill bit, and we just drilled holes. And we, we put hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of fiber in, so this was not a small, I mean, small compared to the UK and everything else, but it was still more than just some, a backyard project. Um, and, and, and these were some of my team members. I was really into doing it locally. And uh, we built, uh, we, built we, had, we had a lot of fun. Uh, and many of them have gone on and done other things, which is really gratifying. Um, they're, 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 the difference from where they were born to where they are now is a lot greater than most of us in this room. They started without any education, with only knowing, in this case, Kenya, Rwanda, Rwanda, and they, uh, they then became computer scientists and technology chiefs and running the infrastructure for the country and, and have left the country and are working all over the world. And so that's pretty gratifying. Um, but it goes to show that, but for education, right, we are no different. So if you took all your kids and you said, okay, children, no internet, no books, right? No TV, maybe a good thing. But, you know, and, and what do you expect from them? What are they gonna do? So we need to make this change for society because it's in the darker areas of humanity and, 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 and locations where the stuff that you don't really like to see and hear about happens, and it does overflow to where we are now and into the cities in the developed world, but it's also really bad for the people who live there who are not causing the, the, the bad things to happen. If you give people opportunity, they'll grow. Uh, I talk about this in two ways. One, say if we, if we want, if you just wanna be social, then it's a great thing to do for humanity and for people to give them opportunity and civic uh, experiment, understand civic experimentation and understand uh, gender equality and understand all these, all these social issues. If you just want to be financially involved then or motivated, well, there half the world is, is a market that we aren't actually able to sell to. They can't buy from us, we can't buy from them, we can't ex exploit or, you know, and, and build our businesses on, and they can't build their own businesses. So either way, it's a good thing. 
And I'm hoping, um, and, and I've, I'm hoping we can accomplish that, bringing people together on a global basis from, from uh, and really conquer distance. So I had this telecom operations, and we had all sorts of everything you can imagine. We had, uh, um, you know, fiber and DSL and, and, and 3G and 2G, and I had Huawei and ZTE and every other telecom, Nortel and everybody else in there. Um, and it was it was it was a challenge, but it but it worked. But my problem wasn't my gigabit speed around between ministries and other places. The problem was to get back to the internet. You had to go to a satellite 36,000 kilometers away which meant 700 milliseconds of latency at least. I know people talk about theoretical latencies of 600 milliseconds, I, you know, or 560 in a perfect world. The perfect world is somewhere else. And where I was, we didn't have that perfection. And usually you get to a second, right? Just because it just happens. There's just too much congestion. And you've got all these computers on this sort of remote island, and they're all updating. We used to, on Microsoft, remember they used to update on Tuesdays? So then all of them are updating. And Microsoft didn't have like some caching server that you could put in. So they all had to go back to Seattle and, and, and pick it up. So it really just congested the network. Um, so this was a huge problem. So I tried to run fiber. To, to the area um, from a, a major uh, point, a major uh, fiber node. And, 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 I, and I put uh, about $25 million into running a fiber down the east coast of Africa. Um, frustration is trying to get like 10 African countries together to do something. Uh, frustration is getting 10, 10 countries anywhere together to do, to do something. And I, and I realize one thing that if you're trying to make massive political change and massive regulatory change, um, you have to have a, a lot of time on your hands. Uh, so I, um, I kind of pushed, stepped aside from that and started thinking, what if we could just bring these satellites closer? Now, I'm not a satellite engineer, so I didn't know it was hard. And so I just started thinking about, well, what if we brought them down? And then I went to the ITU and started looking at spectrum and understanding how it all worked. And it turns out the KA spectrum was available and acquired those rights, and then uh, decided that, you know, and, and figured out that if we built the system, that we could actually bring fiber quality connectivity to these rural markets, uh, and just br by bringing the satellites closer and having it on an equatorial orbit. And that was the genesis of O3B networks. And so there I was, again, I, I had the telco and had all this efforts going on in Africa, and I realized I had one foot in the US and having built companies and, and generate uh, returns for people on one foot in Africa. And so I knew both cultures. And I thought, you know what? This is going to take a billion dollars. It's, but it's something that needs to be done. And I'll probably fail. But I'm in a position where I could probably have a, as good a shot as anybody to put the whole thing together. So I went and, and we built it. And we have a lot of great team members. Uh, we raised about a billion and a half dollars. Uh, in 2009, the, the financial crash happened, which was problematic when you're trying to raise a billion dollars to sell bandwidth to people who have no money. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, fortunately, um, we had some good people. Larry Page did come in, and John Malone, and other people had said, Greg, you know, we're with you. And uh, uh, we were very fortunate. So that's up and it's running now. It's owned by SES, and it's uh, uh, got a lot of customers on it, and many of you might know about it. Um, but I founded that, and that's the genesis. That's where it all came from. And uh, I'm really proud of what the team has, 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 has done with it. So 2012 comes along, and I'm looking at this picture. 54% of the world still has no internet. And started thinking, and I was semi-retired for the fourth time or something, and I just decided, this has really got to change. We must do something. It's still too big of an issue. And, uh, uh, I started to come up with a vision, a plan, like, okay, what does success mean? Success meant a self-installed terminal on a school that you could give at least 50 megabits per second to the school. And there's about 2 million schools that are without, it, without access. Right? So 2 million schools times n use, uh, kids is a lot of kids who have no opportunities for education. And uh, uh, we really we must change that. So it needs to be solar powered. It needs to be self-installed. right? You want Wi-Fi and LTE because when you're walking along with your phone and you're on Vodafone or whatever, whoever other network or MTN, it should just work. And, uh, and the technology was available to do that, or is available to do that. So we developed a bunch of technologies which will help make this happen. But this was sort of the, the beginnings of the vision. 
let's get every school connected. And if you look at our website and you look at what we talked about, part of the mission, by 2022, every single school will have internet access. Now, for those of you who have satellite systems and broadband or in telecom, help. Go connect with your own systems. Right? Like, we're just trying to get it done, and we all can work together to get it done. It's not, it's not a, a, a competitive thing at all, because this is, this is bigger than any of us, and it's an important thing for society. So that's the mission. So I started thinking about how to do this, because as we saw, fiber's not the way. Um, and so I went to the ITU back again, and you always start with spectrum. You want to do something in satellites? You start with spectrum. You can't just say, I'm going to build fast satellites, then go try and find the spectrum. It doesn't, at least, uh, that, that hasn't worked out for, for many people, and, and I don't see it as a good path. So into this ITU, and fortunately, the entire KU band, the K, well, not the entire band, a, a, a slot of spectrum was available that had been set aside for specifically for this purpose, connecting the rural populations. And so we acquired three and a half gigahertz of globally harmonized spectrum. Aha, we couldn't interfere with the geos. So we had to design a system which would never interfere with the geos, and that would unlock that spectral value. So that was what we did. Uh, and um, the system looks a little bit like this. And uh, I'll tell you something which we haven't mentioned about this, but um, what you're seeing is it's a pretty simple system in this case. You've got a satellite. It's got a bunch of beams on the ground. You've got your gateway, and the gateway hits the satellite and sends signal down to the beams. The terminals underneath those beams just hand over as you go through a piece of spectrum to a piece of spectrum. So it just changes frequencies, much like when you drive down the highway and you're switching from cell tower to cell tower. So we have these really unique beams. As you see, they're actually elongated. And that allows us to turn them on and off any time a beam would be in interfering with the, uh, with the geo arc. So what we proved time and time again, and have done all the EPFD studies, equivalent power flux density studies for you regulatory people, um, we proved that it will not interfere with the geos. And, and we actually, when we went out and I raised money, um, in my first round, we raised uh, about $500 million. Intelsat and Hughes both came in um, as geo operators. And of course, they don't want to be interfered with. So we had to show them and prove that this would not interfere. So there'll be a lot of gateways around. and. Uh, and, and we'll be able to cover the whole Earth. Now what you're seeing is 18 planes, about 800 satellites or so. What we haven't announced yet, a little secret, is that uh, we've got another 2,000 satellites or so in our filings that we're gonna be cranking forward on. We just don't talk about them. But we'll start to talk about those soon. Um, uh, with uh, MASA, our investor, and the mission of enabling access and bridging this divide on a global basis by 2027, he's really put the throttles full forward and said, just build everything you can. So you'll, you'll see or hear about some really great large scale steps, step function changes to our plans and improvements um, uh, in the near future. And so we're really looking at a lot, of, a lot of things. You'll see some more here. You'll see some more um, satellites in a few other places that you wouldn't expect. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's exciting times, very exciting times. And some things that aren't satellites that will be helping accomplish our mission. So you'll, you'll, we're having a lot of fun. Um, but you have to build a satellite. So this is all nice to look at, but if you can't build a satellite, and of course we want a satellite that was $500,000. Uh, so that's cheap for satellites, for those of you in the industry. Um, but we designed it. We designed our satellite ourselves. And then we went out to put it to bid, um, to, to bid pe for people to become joint ventures with us in building a factory to build these satellites in volume. And Airbus, who's a sponsor here, uh, is, our, is invested in OneWeb and became a partner in our satellite production facility. So we're actually setting up, and I'll show you some pictures of it, but we're setting up a, a satellite production facility in Florida. We have one in Toulouse, one line in Toulouse. The two lines in Florida will be up this year. And we'll be able to produce three satellites per day. We've reached out to the industry and worked very closely to help them develop lots of cool technologies that we laid the, the foundations of and funded um, that enable high volume production of these, um, of these satellites at a very, very highly reliable rate. So or, or they're, they're extremely reliable. They will be more reliable than the geos you're used to. People who talk about, oh, we'll build them and they'll break and we'll put other ones up there, got to be careful about that because it's not like you can leave a lot of trash up in space 
if we want to use it for us and our generations to come. Uh, a piece of uh, debris at 1,200 kilometers is uh, uh, going to stay in space for about 2,783 years. So it's not like it's biodegradable. You, you really have to be conscious of what you're doing. Um, so that's why very reliable satellites are very important. Our deorbit systems are, 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 are critical from our perspective. We've got redundancy across the satellite, multiple GPSs, multiple avionics, multiple reaction wheels and star trackers and all, that other, all those other things. So we're taking it very, very seriously, uh, the team is. Um, so you see that we have this, these beams that go on and off. And so one thing you'll notice the upper left-hand corner is uh, one of our, um, our archangels, if you will, Qualcomm. Without Qualcomm, we couldn't make the system because the hardest part of the system is the little chip that sits in the user terminal. That chip has to hand over frequency to frequency to frequency, not just in this nice linear fashion that you're looking at, but all the little corner cases where it's on the edge of one and an edge of the other and you don't want it handing over and flipping over. And, and we want to do that with a chip that's extremely cheap, uh, like really inexpensive, and we needed it to operate at a very low power rate while still doing gigabit per second. A lot of, a lot of, lot of you know, requirements on this thing. So uh, we want it to be like 14 nanometers. But you can't just go to TSMC and say, hi, I, can you build me 100,000 14 nanometer chips, right? That's like the prize fab stuff. Um, but fortunately, with Qualcomm, they have that ability. You know, they're shipping 2.5 million chips a day. And so what we did was we de designed their next generation chip to work with our system, the next generation chip that'll be in all your cell phones. So we're very fortunate to have something that is gonna operate at extremely low watts, low wattage, very, very low watts. Um, uh, uh, 10 times less power requirements than any satellite chips you've seen today and have very high throughput. So it can, but the low wattage is for solar because remember we need to be solar powered. This needs to be able to operate off of a little solar panel about this big and still provide very high speed connectivity. So we're really lucky to have Qualcomm. And they know a lot about handover because that's what they do. Um, so latency was another thing that was really important in this system design. Latency is about the time it takes to go, your packets to go back and forth. And if you want to do, um, you know, the geo stuff, we're out here, right? 36,000 kilometers, 700 milliseconds. And that's kind of fine for broadcast. It's really not really good for, for web, and it's horrible for gaming, and it's unusable for machine to machine and cellular signaling. So when you hear people talk about, oh, we have a cellular backhaul over geo, we really don't. You have a cellular backhaul to an island site that you know, you're not handing over to other things. But we want to be able to place a terminal at the corner of streets in London and have it hand over between the macro cell to our, micro, our small cell and then back out to the macro while you're driving by at 30 kilometers an hour or on the highway while you're driving at, a, at, at 100 kilometers an hour. So that's re the latency is extremely important. In fact, the LTE standard is 80 milliseconds. So we had to get below 80 milliseconds in order to meet that latency. So O3B, even at 130 milliseconds, didn't meet the latency requirements to have fully integrated high-speed handover of your, of, your, of your cell phones. So we brought it down to 1,200 kilometers in 30 milliseconds. So what does that mean? That means we can do things like this, where you can just put a backhaul on a tower. And now we're part of the mobile in, in, in infrastructure. There's no difference. We've done all the testing, and I'll show you some cool stuff here. That we've done all the testing, there is no difference on a, on a, if your backhaul is one web, fiber, or microwave. The core network at whatever telco will not see a difference. And that changes things a lot for telecom operators because they can now decide, do I want microwave, do I want fiber, what's cheapest on that particular location? And we become the catch-all. And it's the same thing for, for homes, and I'll talk about that in a second. But you know, there's 7.5 million rural 2G towers that they just can't get backhaul to. And they don't have room to put a generator, and they don't have room to put big dishes, and they don't have room to put anything. They just need something that they can put on your arm, carry, and throw it up there and, and get really, really uh, high speed. Um, some of the things that we're seeing are, are combined cellular backhaul, cellular coverage, and lighting. 
So in a lot of rural areas. So these you can just stick in the ground. There's nothing to it. It's just a solar panel, lighting, LED lighting, and you're good to go. And it just automatically finds the, cell, the, 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 the cellular provider and starts working. Um, with really good luck, you'll notice that we have Bardi. We have a, we have a number of uh, telecom operators, and SoftBank's a telecom operator. They obviously are big in Japan, and they own Sprint in the US. Uh, so very large um, uh, telecom properties that are, that are uh, excited about the potential to extend their reach, not just to the rural areas, but to those little dark spots. I mean, you guys have probably dropped a call, maybe even in London. And so there's dark spots everywhere. And we just want to make it so simple to, to solve that problem. And we, I, I think we have. Um, so this is a backhaul integrated small cell. And we'll, it'll be solar powered. We have NB-IoT and other things built into it. So you know, narrow band in, in, internet of things, uh, full hand in and hand out with the macro cell. So it's all, it's, it's all designed to be integrated. Um, show you some kind of cool stuff. Uh, you know, this is a bad version of installation, but it gives you a sense of where the residential side is going. Um, we didn't design the right clips on this, but this just shows you kind of um, the size and scope of, of residential. So we've got very small terminals that are coming. Revolutionary, really, in terms of their size. Um, but we have a lot of power, and we have a lot of the right uh, uh, chips, and we're able to pull a lot of signal out of noise to get um, very high throughput out of very small, thin terminals. So you'll see some cool, uh, uh, really cool uh, uh, applications for these things. Um, 300 megabits, 50 milliseconds. You know, we're, we're really looking at uh, a very low cost, very easy to install terminals. Now in 2019, in the UK, you still have three to 5%, sometimes I see 10% of your homes that are without access. You know, our mission is to make sure that all those homes get connected or have the ability to be connected. So right here, you have the same problem that they do in Namibia. And uh, uh, we're excited because we do a lot of things in the UK. We have a pretty big presence here um, in terms of uh, uh, we've got people here. We work with a lot of uh, suppliers, suppliers here, not just Airbus, but there's a number of other suppliers. So we, we've created quite a few jobs in the UK, combined with, with SoftBank, of course, with Arm and with the, the fund. There's a, a lot of uh, collective uh, uh, jobs and, and, and uh, entrepreneurship that, that you know, are UK-based. And so it's really important to us that we turn on the UK as one of our first places. So uh, we're looking forward to that in 2019, being sort of the, someone described as the internet catch-all. And the government, from, uh, not just here, but other, they say, well, we've got this idea, we're gonna run fiber there, we're gonna run fiber there, and I'm like, great, go. Well, it's expensive. Th then decide if you wanna do, whatever you do, great, go for it. Whatever you don't do, we'll just take care of. And so that's, we don't want people to stop running fiber. We don't want them to stop running microwaves or putting in DSL or whatever else they want to do. We think broadband's important for everybody. We'll just pick up whatever's remaining. And uh, uh, I, I'm just sure they can't get it all. Um, so across the, U, the EU itself, you know, a lot of countries have 20% without access to the internet. And so this is you know, sad for the EU because if you want to do digital government, digital education, you really, uh, and digital health, you're, you're, it's, it's just expensive and tough to do it without, without internet access. So Coca-Cola is an investor. Um, we were, again, really lucky to have Mutar Kent, uh, who's the CEO of Coca-Cola. Uh, so what about Coca-Cola? Why are they an investor? Well, they're the world's largest distribution company. Like, have you ever been anywhere that you can't find a Coke? Like an island in Indonesia, Indonesia, forget about London and Paris, like go to you know, Papua New Guinea in the farthest backwoods, you're hiking, you're like, I don't see anybody, oh, Coke. You know, and it's cold, right? <laughs> they have 39 million, this is over 123 years or something, they've built up 39 million points of distribution. And that's a pretty large network of little tiny shacks everywhere. And they figured out in India how to sell it by the cup and in other places how to sell it in the bottle and how to sell it, you know. So they really understand the local environments that we're going to be going into. And those 39 million about, you know, so I'm, I don't know the total, the right number, it was 15, 12 million are extremely rural. We're having access to them 
to, the, to those locations from an inventory control and IoT perspective is really helpful. But the other side of it is what they found and did some studies in South Africa that when you take these very rural sort of think of as mom and pop Coke uh, reseller, when you add internet and connectivity as a sell as an as as a proposition for them to sell to their customers, you're increasing their local revenue, their local income. So it's really good for the resellers in the local. Uh, 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 very rural populations to be able to offer these services. So um, that's something we strive to do is to help build the economies, I mean, micro economies. Uh, we're talking about some of the studies showed like a $50 a month increase. And $50 a month is actually a lot of money in these places. So you have to, it really boosts uh, uh, their, their capabilities. Um, not just Cokes, but I mean the, the resellers, the entrepreneur. So we've done a lot of things at schools in Mexico. We looked at clips that we can put on and you can manually insert that a high school uh, girl could easily um, install and then become the local ISP. Um, we moved to some of the more, you know, you can see some of the more things that you're used to maybe. Um, a connected car is gonna be a big area coming, you know, cars globally, to be able to have very thin, small antennas inside of a connected car and give it uh, hundreds of megabits per second anywhere it goes and be able to work seamlessly handing in and handing out with the macros. So we've got a lot of activity in these areas with a lot of uh, uh, different providers. Something really cool here, I'll show you this macro sense, so, um, which we, we worked on for a while and patented this ability for that terminal on the top of that roof. So you put it on the roof, when you're driving along and the cell tower goes away, it's sensing the cell tower. When that cell tower goes away, it automatically hands over your cell phone. So if you're a firefighter, you never even drop a call. It just hands over like a normal handover, like you're doing you know, 5,000 a day of, or 500 a day probably. So this would allow you to be anywhere in the world, not just anywhere in the UK and have very high speed internet access as an emergency response unit. And again, we're going well beyond satellite because we're not a satellite player. I don't really, I know this is an aeronautic society and everything, we have satellites in the mix, but we're, we're a global broadband player. And uh, we do things like this where when your terminals are together, it will automatically, every millisecond, organize into a new cellular coverage area. So if there's no coverage or the Maybe the cell phones are down because of a tsunami. As the cars and trucks come together, you can walk from one to the other and actually hand over. And as they move around, it will re re uh, re reassemble itself into a network. So it's really, really cool technologies. Um, so Airbus is an investor, and, and we've spent a lot of time talking with about aviation and, and, every, and others. GoGo -Go is, is someone who's taking down, or will be taking down capacity, and, and, and I believe that was announced already. Um, but there'll be a, plenty of them, plenty of, of providers that are taking down capacity for aviation, because we can cover pole to pole, gate to gate connectivity. Uh, and hundreds of megabits per second of the same connectivity quality that you have in your living room. Um, and other normal sort of mobility stuff that you think about for satellite trains, easy. Oil rip platforms, pretty straightforward. Um, we've got some a really good technical partner base. We're really an assembly of great companies. Like we have our own uh, fast-growing staff, but we also have these great uh, companies that are we're slightly orthogonal to their current programs and their CEO or chairman level. In every company, it's always the CEO or chairman that's either on our board or made the investment or focused on it. So we get the A-class a people within their company and a very high level of visibility. So Tom Enders is on our board uh, from Airbus, for instance. And so uh, they've been put hundreds of people. So we've got 250, probably getting closer to 300 now, people at Qualcomm, we are it. We are what they do. They are building the software and the firmware. We have the chips working, by the way. We've got end-to-end -end testing of all of our satellites. You can send in a signal on one side, have it come through the other, through our emulators. We can do the handovers. Um, actually, that's kind of fun. I'll, uh, let me see if this will work. I could actually show you something, if it works. Let's see. All right, so yeah. Um, so this gives you an example of what uh, that initial constellation looks like. And if we wanted to, um, do a little playback, well, one time's fine. So if we want to look at this, you can see that one just handed over. So if I go over here, you can see that the user terminal's there, and you can see the satellite is handing over beams, um, and all the, this is actually going through an emulator. There's actually a lot of logic behind this, but it's handing over frequencies 
in this case, you're just at the end of it, so we can sort of back out of that. And um, there's a gateway like. Uh, but I'll show you something kind of cool if it works here. Uh, not the video streaming. No. Um, let me see something here. Oh, it's not running here. Um, small cell view, but I guess I don't have it in this version. Um, but this gives you uh, an example of uh, playback controls. Let's go one time. Restore layout. Now, this is a demo for. Let's see. Oh, there we go. So what you're seeing here is a car running, and it's uploading a photo right now. And it's running through this network on the right, and all the handovers and everything are going on as you see it. And you can see the uplink. In this case, it's just uploading a photo. It's not meant to be about the maximum speed. What we're testing here and demonstrating is the actual handover. You see that white line, you're actually handed over from one tower to another. So right now, you're driving along, you're up, the, self, the person in the car with the cell phone is uploading, or downloading, they just finished it, so they'll turn it on again. Now they're uploading, and they're uploading to that cell tower. So that cell tower is on one web backhaul. So everything is emulated back to the core network through one web. So you can see that the handover is seamless, so now they'll start downloading again, and they're downloading, and now they're gonna hand over to the next tower, doesn't stop the download. Right, no changes. So we've actually gone through all the LTE. Qualcomm, which is a major participant and inventor of LTE, has been very, uh, uh, has done, we've done a lot of detailed analysis, and frankly, they've done the lion's share of the work to make sure that we can do handovers and we can work right seamlessly inside of the mobile operator's network. It is not a trivial task. Uh, it's far from it. But um, for Qualcomm, you know, they want, everything has to work perfectly. If you think about shipping a chip, for instance, um, let me just show you something here and then we'll kind of wrap it up. If you think about shipping a chip for cell phones that needs to be backwards compatible with every single cell tower out there, Right? You get a new cell phone, and it's going to be backwards compatible with the one in Namibia and the one here, and everybody else is 2G, 3G, LTE, and all the, revers uh, the, the, the version control and revisions. It's very hard. But they do that, and when you're shipping 2.5 million chips a day, they got to work. So we've been really fortunate to have that meticulous uh, uh, amount of energy that they've been bringing to the table. Uh, this is a picture of the factory in Florida that we're um, building. We're breaking ground next week. Um, on and we should have, uh, we've actually done all the pre-work, so it should be actually up in November or October of this year. Um, so coming back to enabling connectivity for everyone, you know, how do you enable it? We want to empower communities to build their own networks. We want to make it simple enough to install your own internet wherever you are in the world and become your own ISP if you want to. And there's the mission. Uh, we're far along on the path. We have, uh, uh, we're having a lot of fun, but uh, that's it. I'm happy to take any questions, but that's what we're working on.